Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. It's so nice to see all of you here. My name is Monty Peterson and as it says in the bulletin, I graduated from Luther Seminary about a year ago. Um, I am new to Wisconsin, moved here this summer and am now awaiting a call in the Greater Milwaukee Synod. So it is lovely to get to be here and get to meet more of the people in the Milwaukee Synod and to worship with you all today. So now let us begin our worship with a Thanksgiving hymn. Thanksgiving is this week. So please stand as you are able and let's sing together. Come ye thankful people come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please join together with me in the prayer of the day. God of light, there can be overwhelming obscurity in this world, but you shine your light and increase joy. And for your brilliance, we are grateful. Amen. reading is from Isaiah 9. 
but there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the lamb, land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in gar darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests on, upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually. And there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onwards and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of God. Thanks be to God. The gospel reading is from John 8. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The word of God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to move this up a little bit here. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth, meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, for you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today is Christ the King Sunday. We have that on our bulletin here. Christ the King Sunday, or some call it Reign of Christ Sunday. This is the last Sunday of the church year, and next week is the first Sunday of Advent, so that is the beginning of the church year. And sometimes people squirm a little bit with Christ the King Sunday, right? It's that word king that can make us feel different things. It can bring up images of hierarchy and patriarchy and colonialism and things that really should have no place in the church but have been intertwined with the church for many, many years. And even if you aren't bothered by that word king, it can also invoke these ideas of sort of an out of touch, you know, very irrelevant sort of reality, a fairy tale something again that we really don't want to have anything to do with how we think of Christ. Christ is certainly not out of touch or irrelevant or a fairy tale. So what do we do with Christ the King Sunday? Well, I went looking for its history and I was surprised to learn that it is not an old Festival. Many of our days that we celebrate in the church year are very old. They go back a long time, but this one is not old. Pope Pius XI in 1925, he established this day, and it was for the Roman Catholic Church. It was to remind Christians, hear this again, this was 1925, so this was to remind Christians that their primary allegiance was to God and not to any earthly authority, as was claimed at the time by Mussolini, right? This was in Italy that the Pope declared this. The Pope saw that there was actually a number of competing allegiances at that time. There was communism in Russia, there was the growth of fascism in Italy and Spain, there was just secularism in the West in general. 
And in opposition to, in contrast, to all of these isms, this communism or fascism, this day proclaimed that Christ was our ultimate allegiance. Christ was the one to whom we owed that ultimate reality. And this, I quote, this proclaimed that Christ was the goal of human history, the focal point of the desires of history and civilization, the center of humankind, the joy of all hearts, and the fulfillment of all aspirations. It was not just a statement against all of these other powers that can claim our allegiance, but it was a statement for something, a statement about the reign of Christ, about Christ as the ultimate reality in our lives. Should I move this? Would, it, would that help if I moved it a little bit? Okay, great. So in our text today, we heard words of the prophet Isaiah, and Isaiah also knew something about competing allegiances. In fact, this is a theme that we find throughout the Hebrew scriptures, long before Isaiah was even alive, back in the days of Samuel, this was a tension between the Hebrew people and God. You see, these people, they wanted a king. And God, however, wanted to be their king. God did not want a competing allegiance. But all of the surrounding nations had kings, and so the Hebrews were convinced that if they had a king also, that would make them safe. God eventually said, fine, have it your way. <laughs> if this is really what you want, then you can have a king. And so Samuel anointed Saul as their first king. The problem, however, is that Saul was human <laughs> and he disobeyed God. Surprise, surprise. And so then we can fast forward through Israeli history and there were a lot of kings who obeyed or disobeyed God, you know, to various degrees. So now we get to the time of Isaiah, our prophet today, and at this point the king was Ahaz. To be precise, actually, Ahaz was the king of the southern kingdom because part of what had happened in this long history of human kings is that there was division, which is maybe also not a surprise. So they had divided between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So King Ahaz is now the king of Judah, which is the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom at this point had already been conquered by the Assyrian Empire, and the southern kingdom, Judah, was living quite uneasily in its shadow. King Ahaz is trying to preserve Judah by aligning with the Assyrians, by aligning with this very evil power, but yet they were the power, and so that is how he thought we would keep our country safe is that we will align with them. But it had not worked out very well. And this is not what Isaiah had advised. This was going against Isaiah's advice, and it had not worked out. There was slavery, and there was violence, and there was war. We heard these images in our text today of the yoke of their burden, the rod of their oppressor, tramping warriors, garments that are rolled in blood, and so the people were waiting for God to act. And then in the midst of these really terrible times, this time of waiting for God, Isaiah is inviting them to take hope. He is saying this time will not last forever. There will be rejoicing. There will be freedom. There will be peace. And why? Why do we know these things? because a new king has been born. So this new king, Hezekiah, this was Ahaz's son, and that is who this particular scripture that we read, this song was written for, was for his birth, or maybe for his coronation, we're not sure, but in any case, it was for Hezekiah, this new king whom they believed was going to usher in a time of peace and prosperity. You know those images that we have seen, 
uh, from World War I and World War II of the victory parades and of the soldiers coming home, that kind of relief. That is the kind of relief that Isaiah is offering to the people, that there is going to be an end to all of this madness and all of this war, and a new time is coming. Now, Hezekiah, in fact, was a really wise and faithful king, and he did usher in a time of peace and prosperity. He executed just policy. He brought in religious reforms. He decided to trust God for their security rather than aligning with Assyria. So he did bring this time of peace. But here is the thing. It didn't last. Egypt was knocking at the door, Babylon was knocking at the door, and then there was the Persian Empire, and then the Greek Empire, and then eventually the Roman Empire. That is who is in control when the Jesus um, is born. He was about as good as a human king could be, but still, it didn't last. It couldn't last. So as Christians, when we look back at these promises that Isaiah gave, we claim that Jesus has fulfilled them in a way that no human could, even Hezekiah, as good as a king could be. And so when we read, a child has been born for us, a son given to us, we think of Jesus born in Bethlehem. When we hear those titles, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, we, uh, we probably hear the music in our heads, right? We hear that song going, but we think of Jesus as the one who has fulfilled these promises in a way that no human could. What's hard for us, though, is that though we believe and we affirm and we confess that Jesus has fulfilled those promises, that Jesus has come, that Jesus is still coming, into our lives and that Jesus will come to fully and finally fulfill that. We believe all of that and yet, and yet, we still live in this world, this world of not yet, this world where it seems like there are so many other powers that are actually winning. We live in a world where rates of addiction and mental illness are growing where violence is seen as a way to solve problems, where fear is in control of things, where there is a desire for economic growth at all costs, even at the cost of our natural world. We live in a world where there is enough food for all people, and yet some people still go hungry, a world where some lives are seen as worth less than other lives. And so it sure seems like something else is winning besides Christ. It doesn't really feel like Christ is our king, right? But when we proclaim that, when we proclaim that Christ is king, when we have a day like today that says Christ is king, we are proclaiming that all of those other powers that we see every day in our lives and in the newspaper and on the news, that they are only temporary that they will not win, and that the lives that are lost in the meantime, that they are not lost forever. The power of the resurrected Christ, the power of the Christ who is king, it's not a power over. It may not be the power that we are wanting that rides in on a white horse and just you know changes everything in the blink of an eye, but it is the power of the mustard seed that grows into a tree. It's the power of the persistent widow who never gives up, of the shepherd who leaves the 99 and goes in search of the one. It is the power of one who was betrayed, who was abandoned, and who was left to die. And if we can believe that that power is actually what changes the world, then we don't need to despair when it seems like that the bad guys are winning because we are playing a completely different game with completely different rules. The self-giving love 
and compassion of Christ, that is actually the power that rules our universe. It's not military might. It's not economic realities. It's not political parties. And now you might be saying, well, Pastor, that sounds really nice, but it is not actually based in reality. So let's talk about reality here. What does that self-giving love of Christ actually look like in real life? Where have you seen the reign of Christ? Where have you seen it in this church? Or maybe in the community of Milwaukee or in your own lives? I'm sure that we all have stories that we could share if we had time. And we don't have time for that. But I encourage you to really think about that. What are those stories that you know of where you have seen that kind of love of Christ? And share those stories. Share them on your way home from church today or as you gather for coffee because we hear the stories about the powers all the time. So we need to hear these stories too. We need to hear the stories of how Christ is changing this world. So I have two, two stories that I can share with you today, but I really do want you to think about your own stories and share those. The first that comes to mind for me, it's a place called the Carpenter's Boat Shop. And the boat shop, it is a wooden boat building community on the coast of Maine. It's a place where ordinary people come and they spend a year, people who have no woodworking experience, but they come and they spend a year as apprentices learning to build wooden boats and becoming a community together. The vision is that this can be a safe harbor for people, especially people who are in times of transition. And the beauty of this community is that people really do come from lots of different backgrounds and lots of different places, and yet they do learn to live together as a community. And in these daily tea times that we would have where we would all stop our work and gather over tea and muffins, there was this pause in the day where the apprentices and visitors and neighbors would come together and would be a community. And I can testify as one of those former apprentices that it felt like the kingdom of God. And you might also have experienced meals where started off as strangers, but by the end of the meal together, eating together, you didn't feel like strangers anymore. It felt like the kingdom of God. One of the founders of the boat shop, Bobby Ives, he would say that the essence of the Christian life is to live without fear and love without reserve. To live without fear and love without reserve. And that, that is the reign of Christ, to live without fear and love without reserve. Another example for the reign of Christ comes from this book, Change of Heart. It's by Jean Bishop. You might be familiar with this story because it took place not too far from here in Winnetka, Illinois. Change of Heart, it tells the story of this author, Jean Bishop. Um, and she is a criminal defense attorney, and her pregnant sister and brother-in-law were murdered one night, pretty brutally, by a man, David Biro, And yet, Jean, she came to a place of forgiveness, but not even just forgiveness, also of making peace with this man who killed her family. And she became an advocate for more just sentences for convicted criminals, especially those who were convicted as juveniles, as this man was. This is what she says at the beginning of her book. She says, I have a story to tell you. It is a story of change, of seeds being planted and growing, of wind blowing away debris and changing the landscape, of the impossible becoming possible. The story is born of tragedy, of the evil, senseless taking of human lives I held most dear. My first response to that tragedy was to seal a stone over my heart, to take a rock in my hand to throw at the perpetrator, guilty as he was. 
This is the story of how God rolled away that stone, loosened the fingers that gripped that rock till it thudded in the dirt and grew in its stead the green shoots of transformation and new life, renewal and change. The impossible becoming possible. That is the reign of Christ. To live without fear and love without reserve, the impossible becoming possible, this is the reign of Christ, and this touches everything in our lives. From the smallest human interaction that we have with another person, to the individual choices that we make, to the dreams that we have for society and what we do to enact those dreams for our society. It's what enabled Jean Bishop to forgive her sister's killer. And it is what can enable whatever feels impossible for us. Even if that is simply to have hope in a world where there is so, so many reasons for despair. Isaiah told his people in words that are for us too. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And Jesus claimed that he was that light. That he was the light of the world and that those who walk in him, they have that light of life. I know that the days are getting shorter and that light can be hard to come by. But to believe in the light, even when it is dark, that is the reign of Christ. Amen. May it be so for all of us today. And we are now going to sing our hymn that is in the bulletin. What appropriate words, right? This is my father's world. Let me not forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. Those are words to keep in your head and sing all this week long, right? Whenever you need to remember. 
Let us stand now and together affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let's join together in our prayers. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of creation. Gracious God, we come to you today knowing that our ultimate allegiance belongs to you. And yet we are so easily swayed to believe that some other power or means will be the way to change this world. Lord, help us believe in your kingdom, a kingdom that comes in ways we don't expect. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the church throughout the world, that it would truly reflect your light and teach people to love their neighbors as themselves. We pray for this congregation, for the time of transition that it's entering. We pray for the companion synods of the Meru Diocese, Tanzania, and El Salvador, for Reformation Milwaukee. Lord, in your mercy. Our common life depends upon the well-being of creation, and yet we resist changing our lives in order to protect it. Give us the courage and the commitment to care for this world that you have made. Lord, in your mercy. We live in a complex world and a complex time. We pray for peace and justice here in our state, in our nation, and in the world, and for leaders who make decisions on behalf of us all. We pray especially for refugees and for all those who suffer at the hands of their leaders. Lord, in your mercy. We pray now for all who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, especially Aaron, Angie, Anna, and Brock, Mark, Stacy, Kevin, Todd, Andy, Cassandra and Nicole, Elnetta and Ken, Steve, Jim, Alice, Mary Pat, Becky, Judy, Brett, Wendy, Donna, Dorothy, Marge, Ruth, Sandy, George, Terry, and Nancy, and all those others who we now name either aloud or in silence. We pray for those who have lost jobs, those who have lost their way, and those who are losing hope. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we join in the great thanksgiving. The beloved is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And we will say together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We will conclude our service singing, Beautiful Savior. Beloved, go in the knowledge that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. And may the love of God and the grace of Jesus and the accompaniment of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Can I have a moment? Yes. Is this on? Yeah. All right. I have council met again this week, and a um, couple things that we had talked about was we don't have a social ministry group meeting right now. Um, but last year, what we did was we had different um, things that we care about and ways that we wanted to extend our care to these groups or people or anyone in the community or in the world that you all care about. And I made up a calendar. Um, if anyone has things that you wanted to do, like, you know, it can be a collection. We can always do a collection, but if there's making sandwiches for the guest house or create, providing a soup supper uh, for different groups, of course the bike ride for hope or any of those things. But if there's something that you're involved in and or wanted to organize or just wanted um, help to bring to the front of some thing, people in need, um, I would love for you to just fill out, you know, if you think it's a, a month that it would be a good time for us to have the uh, collection or, you know, of course the um, food pantry, you know, collecting food or, or Milwaukee Hope Refor Reformation are all on our list of 
people that we pray about and care for and give to. But if there's anything that you wanted to bring to the front, I'm gonna give these to um, the ushers and please take one and think about and, and pray about it and just write down any anything and, and bring it back, take a picture, put it in the basket. You don't have to put your name on it at all if you don't want to, like you care about this but you don't wanna be the one doing it. You know, you don't have to put your name on it. Don't put your name on it then, you know. So I'd like, I'm gonna put that, I'm gonna give it to Jim and Jean. And then the other thing is, um, I did a little questionnaire and um, we talk about a lot of things at, at council meetings and sometimes it's hard to know, like we're speaking for all of you and trying to do the right thing for the whole congregation and different questions came up and there's, there's just um, five questions on here that maybe would help us get a read on Right now, it's kind of in between. We're looking to call a pastor, and there's, it's just unclear. We have a un, we don't have a king. Or a <laughs> king you, know? um, so you have Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Christ. yeah, and definitely, I mean, he led me to make these, uh, um, or she, or guided. Um, <laughs> um, and you don't have to put your name on these either. Just help us help us, you know, keep this church together or have a plan, you know, let's just try to have some guidance. We are such a good community and we've done so much over these years. So um, please uh, bless us with your words. Mm -hmm. I'll give these to uh, Jim and Jean also. Thanks everybody. All right, are there any other announcements? Okay, well, go in peace and serve the beloved. Amen.